Jeff, welcome to the show. How are you doing? Great. Thanks for having me. So recently you came out a book called The Price of Tomorrow, and the number one thing that you're hammering in that is deflation. Yeah. And right now we're in a very peculiar environment where a lot of people are talking about inflation. Some people are talking about deflation, but I think a lot of people have kind of a cognitive dissonance or an, an issue understanding the two differences. And so if you want to kind of like just spend a second kind of diving into like what is inflation or I would say real economic inflation and what is real economic deflation? Sure. Um, and I think you'd point out, we've been taught to think deflation is bad, right? So we grew up and inflation is a good thing and uh, and that's how economies grow. And, and so we, I, I think we just, we've accepted that. Um, but if you look deeper, um, inflation, it, it, it's really simple. Uh, inflation is when your value, uh, the value of your money is eroded and goods and services in relation to that go up in price. And, and uh, deflation is the opposite. Your, the value of your currency is enhanced as goods and services go down in price. Um, and so no, there isn't a good and bad. It's who wins, who loses. Mm. Um, so it's, it's really as simple as that. But when you have, uh, why, if you have an economic system that is built for inflation and, and highly levered, if you have deflation, the, 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 the debt can't be repaid because it gets more expensive in real terms. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So if you borrowed a house and then you get paid next less the next year and it all costs go down, the cost, the real debt explodes in value. So if you, if you over leverage debt and you have a uh, deflation, you have to reset the debt. There was one of the famous economists, I don't know if it was a Keynesian uh, economist, but they said in the future, things will be so cheap that we wouldn't have to have the wages go up. Yeah, John John Maynard Keynes. Keynes said that, yeah. He, well, he didn't predict that. So in 1930, he wrote a, an article that said uh, the economic uh, possibilities of our grandchildren. And in that, he predicted a 15-hour work week. Mm. Um, and so you, you would have all the abundance with a 15-hour work week. And I don't, I don't comprehend why that is a bad thing. Right? So if you could have the same lifestyle and prices went down and they kept go, uh, going down, and you could work less and you could have more free time, I don't I don't see why why we're fighting so hard to stop that from happening. But but uh, but but we've lived in an inflationary environment all our lives, and governments are trying to stop at all costs, including breaking the structures uh, of, of what made capitalism work, including breaking the structures, making capitalism and eventually breaking their currencies to stop deflation. Well, I think there's two types of world we're living in, very similar to 1984 and George Orwell. We have the stock market, which is not the real economy. This is an inflationary pseudo economy. And then you have the real economy, the street economy. And inflation helps the people on top the people who have these so quote unquote, they call it, you know, their, their paper value, not yeah. liquid cash, but paper value. And inflation propagates. We've seen this since 08, the stock buybacks, an exponential rate. They're doing everything today. They've printed north of $7 trillion of Fed, and who knows when that's going to stop. So they're printing money and they're trying to propagate the stock value as much as possible. But for them, this is good. They want to propagate the stock market. But for you and I, let's say a regular working class person, say nine to five, that has inflation hitting their salary on a day to day basis, no deflation, definitely Vancouver and Toronto, real estate prices are skyrocketing since who knows, the 1990s. And so I, I, I literally see in parallel this two different universes living. Yeah, it's way bigger than what you think. It is. It's exactly what you said, but, uh, but it's bigger. Than, it's far bigger than that. So in the world today, to create um, in the last 20 years to fight against the natural forces of deflation. Governments have printed, or when you say printed, created debt in excess of $185 trillion mm. right, in the last 20 years. And that has only produced GDP growth of 46 trillion. And that's a really important stat. And that was all before COVID. Right now, now it's massive more easing right? And, and, and the economy is, is going to be smaller. So the debt to GDP globally is so staggering. If you create that much debt, uh, it becomes a drag on future earnings. 
right? Future GDP, GDP, paying back the debt with interest has to make GDP go down over time, right? Just like if you if you borrowed money and then couldn't pay the that money back when you borrowed more, and then you borrowed more, and mm. then you borrowed more, eventually the time comes due that you owe that money back, right? And and when you have to stop pulling demand forward and pay the money back with it with interest um your purchasing power while it looks high and while you're borrowing money and it looks like you have an in internal economy that looks really great um it has to go down later with all of that debt and so globally that much printing or that much debt creation creates that problem but uh but it but it's worse than that so and 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 if that debt could be repaid it would slow the economy down, right? It was essentially you're borrowing from the future to pay mm -hmm. for today. And later on, our kids would have to pay way more in slower growth and taxes and everything else to be able to pay that back. But, but because this is a structural change that's happened because of technology, the debt can't be paid back. And so governments are turning to printing money out of thin air, which is debasing currencies. Um, and, and, and changing it changing currency values all over the world. So if if China comes out and they have to lower their currency value to keep people employed, and everybody knows in China that they have to, then what they uh, what the citizens of China will try to get their money outside of China and stick it into our real estate. Mm -hmm. right? And then the real estate goes up. So you're right. Anytime you do this. You're, you're artificially creating winners and you're artificially creating losers. The, the, the greater irony is then government has to step in and protect both, right? So, so it's, it's socialism for the rich and, create, and, and, letting, and instead of letting capitalism work and, and letting things fail. But then because the prices are artificially manipulated higher, housing is mm -hmm. a prime example, then rents are artificially higher. And then you have to bail out society with social programs to pay for those art, those higher prices that you created in the first place. So a colossal waste of money. But well, see, a couple of thoughts I have here. You're taught we you mentioned very basic stuff. So we're talking about taking from the future to pay for today, but you're stealing from the future. You've mentioned $185 trillion has been printed only, and you said key fact has produced $46 trillion of GDP growth. And, and, and keep in mind the forty six trillion is per year. Per year, yeah. Yeah. So. And I'm one hundred percent agreement that the middle class is getting completely squeezed out. It's not really capitalism going on. We have socialism for a select few people, elite socialism. But at the end of the day, no one's gonna be able like you can make taxes higher as all you want, but there's no production. There's no there's no economy. How are you gonna pay back any of this stuff? So that is, so that is, so that's the point when you're when you're artificially juicing an economy so real estate go, uh, goes up and and essentially it's a chase it's a chase for for assets that are not going to be eroded by monetary easing right mm -hmm. that's what people are, are, are doing but but if you understand the structure of that uh, of, of uh, those assets too they have to be taxed at a way higher rate in the future to pay for what you're doing now and that becomes the rub. So you have artificially created um, winners right, by pushing this up, and a lot of those winner with the winners aren't because it aren't created because of their ingenuity. It's because they were in the right time and the right place when governments decided to go in all in and in, in, in printing money, right? Mm -hmm. And then a lot of the, the other people that are left out of that game, it's not because it, it's not because their lack of ingenuity. They just didn't get in the game early enough when asset prices were <laughs> under this trem tremendous rise. And both parties, both sides of that, if you want to, what's causing the dislocation of, of um, the, the almost the polarization of society, right? You have, you have on both sides of the political spectrum, people yelling at each other and, and the, the, the conversations are, they're hard to even listen to because they're both fundamentally flawed, yelling at each other on an existing structure that can't work in the future. Mm -hmm. And so, so and, and neither side realizes that, that one got a gift and one got their pocket picked, right? So, so 
that ends if you keep doing that, if you keep on baking that into society. It ends in revolution. The only way I see this being solved, there's a couple of ways, but I don't see how we can escape a debt jubilee. Like there's no no other way. Like you can keep, especially if we enter, you know, MMT, well, whatever they classify as MMT, I just don't see how they can continue. Even if we have, which we are heading into more of a localism versus globalism, and there will be an increase on supply if you can't get the same production from China, I just don't see how they're going to be able to keep on taxing people like this. Yeah, so let's uh, first explain to the audience what a debt jubilee is, right? It's forgiving of all the debt. Mm -hmm. But, okay, so let's let's imagine me uh, in, in that. And let's, let's say I'm one of the winners. I have a whole bunch of debt, mm -hmm. and I have commercial malls and rents high, everything else. By doing that, you just keep baked in my win forever, right? Whether you do it at a government level, whether you do it as so, uh, I would do it at citizen level. I wouldn't do it at government. The banks, I would have elimination. Like one simple way in the United States is no income tax. Yeah, but but carry if you carry these conversations forward and you understand how the system, the structural system, works today. You can't just kind of artificially do that because it breaks every other connection. Everything's connected. Yeah. Everything's connected. Remember in 2008 when, so in my business in 2008, when we were giving out letters of credit around the globe, there was a time in, a, in about a week period where banks wouldn't accept on either side. They didn't trust the exchange rate. They didn't trust that the other bank had mm -hmm. the money even though they said they had the money. So so you had a breakdown of world trade globally. And it all started, and remember when it started, oh, it's only subprime. It's only the bad borrowers, right? But that subprime then connects to, it, it just connects to into the entire system and the entire system is overpriced because of that leverage. And, and trying to stop that overpricing, it takes it down like a falling knife. Right. So if one and so so last week, uh, the Fed printed or took two point three trillion dollars of of highly leveraged loans off the balance sheets of of bank, of, 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 of banks and uh, and PE funds. And and the reason they did so is because those highly leveraged loans can't be paid back at yeah. oil at minus thirty seven dollars. All of the all of the entire industry there would you buy that industry and buy that debt right it's over right there it's the the business and instead of resetting it and having new operators come in um and and let capitalism work they're bailing out the existing operators mm -hmm. right? but if they don't bail out the existing operators then and that's connected up to the banks then the banks fail mm -hmm. the banks fail and you lose your savings in a bank you have bigger problems. So the so we we've entered a time where there are no easy solutions, and 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 policy and, and policymakers are, are in a really difficult time. Uh, in what is the transition? So every day, Trudeau in our country comes out and uh, announces two to ten billion dollars more in some stimulus, right? We're going to have a deficit this year of somewhere north of $200 billion. And all of that stimulus money is going into propping up the existing system. Mm -hmm. Right? When it is super clear that the super highways of the future are all digital in nature. Right? So we, you used to build roads, or you used to, if, if economies sputtered and you needed to get people back to work. You used to build road, roads and highways and the efficiency of that because people drove to their work <laughs> created gdp gains north of what you spent on the roads and highways so it carried on today today by spending that when 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 zoom went from 10 10 million users to 300 million users in a period of 45 days right and those 300 million users aren't going to go back to 10 million after this Right. which means commercial real estate's over leveraged, which mm -hmm. means a lot of the infrastructure products, all of those people reduce demand for commercial real estate and, and actually speed up of the rate of the rate that technology is moving. And so you mentioned a lot of times before with the correlation or the connection between technology and deflation, 
and you mentioned it's very difficult for policymakers to create some type of plan to get out of this. But hypothetically, let's talk about this. Like, what would you do to get us out of this sticky situation? I would first admit that we were uh, that that technology uh, technology technology creates abundance, right? And look at your phone. Um, so uh, the the phone that your smartphone is is thirteen years not quite thirteen years old. And, and ask yourself how many of the apps you actually pay for. You don't pay for a camera anymore. I don't pay mm-hmm. for my guitar tuner anymore. Mm-hmm. Wow. Mm-hmm. Information. It's all free. Technology drives a price and it gets cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. So the thing that's sitting in your phone that gives you all of that abundance, if that's moving into every corner of society mm-hmm. and it's, it's expanding that at that that rate. It's it's moving at that rate. AI is making it move faster. Data collection and and and, and that's a good thing, right? I'm sure you don't want to give up your phone, right? It gives you tremendous ab- abundance. And where it used to, when I bought my first phone, it was twelve hundred dollars for the phone, two thousand dollars for my first month of, uh, of, of phone calls, and all mm-hmm. the online phone calls. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Um, today, uh, to, today it's a supercomputer in my hand, and, and it gives me massive abundance. And I could buy last year's phone for fifty dollars a month on a plan, um, and and not pay for anything else. Mm-hmm. So you can see it in your phone, right? But that thing, same thing is happening throughout society. So if you if if that's going to advance across society, then it means we should be getting prices coming down everywhere, and more abundance. And these are hard concepts to grasp because we've grown up in a world. We, there's a lot of people that think economics is a science, um, and and, and ec- economics is about value. Economics is not about value. It's about scarcity. Mm. And 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 I can prove that really easily. If economics was about value, then the most expensive thing around would be the air you breathe. Yes, but it's abundant, so you can't charge for it. Technology creates that abundance everywhere um, and is going to do so more and more. So the problem is it competes with jobs. Yeah. Right? Because it takes out jobs. And so governments are asking the wrong question. They're trying to prevent job destruction by printing more money and they're actually making it worse. Right. Um, when they really should be saying, how do we design a, a, a solution? It takes advantage of technology and makes it and doesn't have people working as hard. Have it have the same lifestyle um, while working. My hours. my issue with and you're correct. It's been a deflationary trend since 2010 on iPhones, on computers, like even the nanometer size for chips that are making getting smaller and smaller. And so we've seen a deflationary price on technology. Like I remember the first time I bought a big screen TV. I think it was like fuck five thousand dollars. Like yeah. I walk in Best Buy now. You can buy something ridiculously cheap for like seven hundred bucks. It's like yeah. insane. Uh, but if we're looking at the cost of living, like Maslow hierarchy of needs, housing and produce, that's exponentially gone up, like ridiculously. But why? Why? Now go back. Like you, you know why, right? Because you're you're making things scarce through money supply, right? So so when you're printing money and a store of value becomes a house, mm-hmm. then 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 the store of value is what's scarce and people are trying to make money on something else and it's driving that price up. Mm-hmm. House, house prices would not be any, we, we become deluded into house prices always go up. If you, oh yeah, for just sure. Ask, just ask this question. If there wasn't $185 trillion of stimulus over markets over the last 20 years, that's $185 trillion is a lot of money. Um, would house prices be higher? And the answer is simply no, they wouldn't. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now, that that breaks people's thought pattern because they say, well, my house ha- has to go up because that's my retirement and then I can live off my house. And that is true. That's the world we lived in. But but it can't go on. So No, I always bring point. this up. Like my, my parents bought a house uh, in Toronto, well, multiple. The house that I grew up in, they bought it for 180 uh right now it's like 1.9 1.8 yeah and so okay in co- context matters economy was different the dollar was different everything's completely different it's day and night it's like living on mars like completely different 
And so people still have the same mindset. I'm going to buy this house for $1.5 million. And I presume the house is going to be worth $3.5 million in 10 years. Yeah. By the way, it will be. If it will be under this, if we explode debt that much more in the mm. next ten years, mm. the only way it will be. Um, and but if that happens, then taxes are going to go up on it equally as much to make. But they're going to haul out the city. Who the fuck's going to afford to live three million dollar shitbox house? But but the only reason they can afford to do it is because you devalued the value of the currency to do it. That's the point, and that that picks a pocket of savers and gives it to, to uh, 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 picks a pocket of some and gives it to the other. Again, deflation isn't a good or bad thing. Inflation isn't a good or bad thing. Just different winners, different losers. That's it. I, I see though a problem like, okay, Vancouver and Toronto and you have the, uh, we're both Canadian. So you have the average Canadian household income is around 60 K combined, give or take. Yeah. And you have the average house in Toronto, Vancouver, a piece of shit house is a million dollars. No garage, no nothing. I'm talking about garbage house for a million dollars. First time home buyers, 20%. That means $200,000 liquid cash. I don't know about you. I don't know too many regular people walking around $200,000 liquid cash, not to mention the mortgage very high insurance, yada, 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 yada. Okay, fast forward 10 years from now, property values go up 20, 30%. Let's say classical 4 to 6% per year. Who, who Who's living in these cities? Yeah. So, so that's the point. At some point, right? If you've made a, a, a real estate a bank, and it's just a protection of wealth. Mm -hmm. or, let's let, let, let's look right now. Um, in, in Airbnb. There's a whole bunch of people on Airbnb that bought real estate because they could rent it on Airbnb and and leverage that. And and so, if you had enough capital, if you had that two hundred thousand times a whole bunch of places, you went in and create a new business on Airbnb. And you rent out the, those, and now there's no one renting those, houses, mm -hmm. right? And so prices have to fall materially, and government. But if they fall materially, um, to be able to support the new realities, right? All of the people owning that get wiped out, as do the banks on top of them, because the reset is so is so massive that the banks and actually end up failing too. That's why it's all, con all, all, all connected. I know, but at one point you have to pull the band-aid. So the band I, I, I'm not disagreeing with you. you, you like in, in my book, it, the, the band-aid, you cannot add more debt to a debt problem and think you're going to fix it. Um, the, 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 the wealth poor gap is accelerating by the, because of the same function we're talking about. And, and the real, the, the, the bigger problem that anybody is talking about is that's going to break societies. It's going to break currencies. It's going to break societies. And once you, once you go too far down that road, you cannot unring that bell. bell. Hitler rose to power because of the same thing, because bread lines with people uh, be, 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 um, trying to pay for pay for bread and somebody who rises to power in that because they blame the asset holders mm -hmm. and they say it's not your fault it's their fault so so if we go too far down this path um it's very predictable the next uh, the, what happens next i agree with you it, um, the, uh, if, if and this isn't an if technology is deflationary technology is moving to every corner of our society and that means that a new economic model is required. It is. I get like I really hit on real estate because majority of your income goes to housing and food. And the dirty politics that I've seen, like for example, you're not allowed to have micro suites in Toronto because it's against some stupid bylaws. Like the property I own, I can't build a little house in the back. Like really, really dumb bylaws. I just don't see how going into the future working class people can create a family. So, so just, and, and, and I hate to jump on to prejudices and everything, everything else. Yeah. Be a policymaker today. Right. What, 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 um, it is a hard decision right now because, because right now the entire system, it's a structural change mm -hmm. and it's hard to make that shift on a structural change when all of your tax revenue comes from that and the same tax revenue that you're, 
collecting from that is paying for service programs for everybody else. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's, it's, it's not bad people. It's, it's a bad system. And it's it, it, the best an analog I can come up with is, is this. This happens in business all the time, right? And we look at those businesses and we say, how didn't those CEOs understand, that executive team understand what was happening? Because we have hindsight of 2020, right? And so in a, in a business, and remember, the businesses have some of the best minds running the businesses, right? They're not dummies. Mm -hmm. and so let's look at Blockbuster. Uh, and we all know how the story ends, right? And, and uh, because we have hindsight, but be the be those block blockbuster at the time where this was happening, and you could have bought Netflix for fifty million dollars. Yeah, <laughs> and, and that's it. Everybody laughs. Hi, those stupid people. Those stupid. Yeah. People. So the only thing they missed is how fast technology was moving. Mm. The only thing they missed, because because Netflix business at fifty million dollars was a shitty business. It was DVD ran it back and forth through the mail. And yeah, people don't know it wasn't uh, it wasn't digital at the it beginning. It wasn't digital. Yeah. What, what changed is download speeds went from to overnight, and when that changed, nine thousand stores in Blockbuster became irrelevant overnight. Right. The only thing that the executives missed was how fast technology was moving, and and so what they did as a response to that was add more candy aisles to their stores, mm. right? And so you, and because people want to uh, want movie and can't or want popcorn and, and candy when they watch a movie, like they, it, it's just, it, but, but again, that's why that's a good analog for what we're doing. Now, what governments are faced with right now is what they're doing is adding more candy aisles. Yeah. Right. The, the, uh, technology has created a structural break in the way we've we, we've run um, society, and 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 it's hard to see for people. I have two follow ups. One, there are micro ways that we can remediate within the systemic risk, uh, and I and I've said this before. I think we need to start focusing more on city states where they're devoid of federal f uh, fingers. And so it's very difficult, no different than if you're going into a big billion dollar corporation and trying to rejig it from the ground up. Good luck with that. Um, it's, it's systemic. There's a culture there. You're not going to really change anything. And so instead of trying to change anything, if you look at laws of nature, you don't really change nature. New technology comes into nature. A virus, for example, comes and does this thing. A bacteria comes, an alpha predator like humans. We take over the whole world. And so we introduce a new technology that's far superior to the old technology. And so I, you know, I don't see how we can just change a whole city where I'm more in favor of, and we have examples in North America of city states, which is native reserves. They're technically city states where they have their own constitutional laws and police force, and they can dictate how they behave on that uh, sovereign land where we can start from zero and create actual city states that have better systems and the pre-existing. Of course, it's hard. Of course, it's hard. Of course, it's hard. But I mean, that's a. That's a. It's a. Um, I. It's. I would say when I say hard, I mean impossible, hmm. because what currency are you going to use there? And 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 what what facilitates global trade is a common currency that is exchangeable everywhere. Mm -hmm. And and what breaks it down is every government trying to develop their own currency. And changing the manipulating the currency rates underneath that to be able to influence world trade. So uh, I use China needing to devalue their yuan, or the U.S. needing to devalue their currency right now. And they're going to have to devalue. It's going to keep on going up. They have to. But what happens when that happens is you artificially make your labor cheaper versus a globe, mm -hmm. and and you repay your debts with cheaper currency. So if you keep doing that. You ruin, you ruin tr trust in the fundamental exchange of value. And it's hard to do that. So it's hard for a city state to, that needs to global trade to try to play that game in a global trade mandate. I don't know about global trade. I think the whole idea of globalization is how it's done. I, I think that story is over. Uh, it, 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 it isn't over. Um, it yeah. will, it, so there are certain supply chains that are going to change for sure. 
um, I'm involved in a number of different companies that uh, that, uh, that that help uh, help on that trend and make things more efficient, um, and and can localize supply chains. But as a byproduct of doing it, they also remove jobs because they make things more efficient. Mm -hmm. The whole point here is is technology makes things more efficient, and that reduces jobs. And we're trying to artificially keep jobs by by changing money supply. You know, Peter Drucker said a long time ago, we're entering more of a uh, knowledge economy as opposed to production economy. But like, for example, Canada, 10% of our GDP is oil production. And I don't know how much real estate's in that GDP mm -hmm. equation. And a lot of blue collar jobs in Alberta, Saskatchewan, even British Columbia. Uh, Ontario is more tech oriented, at least in Toronto it is. I, I don't know, call me naive, but I... I like I said earlier, I just don't see how they're going to fix anything unless they pull the fucking bandaid. Yeah, yeah um, it's uh, as an entrepreneur, I want to get kind of what's the first principle and why? Do, what do you need to do mm -hmm. to, go to there? So I I, 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 I agree with you. As a policymaker, you have to build you have to build bridges to that new policy, right? You have to you have to so so. Um, so a way forward, and this is going to be what I'm about to say now is going to be super. Um, uh, people will attack it, <laughs> right, right. Um, but but if you're a policymaker and and real estate makes up twenty or twenty five percent of, uh, of of your GDP, and you realize that it makes up twenty because you've incented that structure mm -hmm. to, to run wild, and and it doesn't gain, it doesn't actually give you a whole bunch of added value down the road then you have to increase the taxes on that to slow that growth down right well you create incentive structures the way that you want the industry to go and and so so instead of piling 200 million or 200 billion dollars of new debt in, in, into existing industry you need to take a portion of that and you need to put it into the highways of the future um, but even that, if you yes. play, even that, if you project this forward, if every government did the right thing and, and drove to, towards technology fa faster, mm -hmm. yeah, there would be more jobs in the short term. The jobs would come out faster, anyways. So, so you have to. You, what you have to solve is what you really have to solve is you have to drive a mindset. That increases the value of savings away from debt and allows deflation to uh, allows deflation to happen so the benefits are broader to society and so this is a good segue because you've talked about this a lot before but Bitcoin yeah how do you see this fit in the whole mix um, so so I'm a I'm a huge believer in Bitcoin and I almost can't believe I'm saying that um but but uh, but i am from a structural reason and, and a network effects uh reason by the way 70 percent of all technology value is driven because of a network effect mm. and the network effect is so basic premise uh, to have your listeners go in and, and research it more but but if i have a if i have a phone i'm a, i'm the only one that has a phone it's worth zero if you have a phone too the network is more valuable every additional user to that to that network makes the network more valuable and it's why google is valued as high as they are it's why amazon is valued as high as i are alibaba the, the internet itself is a giant network effect and as are the biggest monopoly companies on top of it bitcoin works on a network effect the more people that use it the more valuable it is as a store of value. And, and that's what's happening right now. So as governments in Venezuela, uh, a year ago, their inflation rate was 1.8 million percent. And, and so if you held their currency, um, you lost all of it. Mm -hmm. um, if you held Bitcoin that lost 30% that year, uh, you lost 30% instead of 1.8 million percent. And so, so the more people that are, are doing that, and then you could you could pay your bills, or you could you could move it across borders seam seamlessly. And the more people that understand that are driving into Bitcoin and making it more and more valuable as as uh, as as they drive into it. Um, here's again, 
I actually don't know if I want Bitcoin to be successful mm. because for it to be successful means governments have so lost the plot. So when people are talking about millions of dollars on a bit on, on, on each Bitcoin and how much that could go up, uh, up, the the social dislocation from what that looks like is 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 terrible um through uh, through society so i would i would love to see an order so i would love to see governments get uh, uh, get together globally set a new standard that looked like bitcoin and and make a voluntary path to this right or pegged to bitcoin one of the one of the two and made a voluntary path to do to do that I don't suspect in our in 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 how trust looks around the world today that that's possible. So I suspect Bitcoin is a good hedge against that. Yeah, they've been talking on you know, the uh, SDR, the SDR type of yeah. currency they want to bring in, but then that's also a threat against the U.S. sovereign dollar as well. So th so that's that's what hap happens. Everybody's protecting protecting their own geopolitical kind of currency and everything else and by doing so everybody's racing for their own currency is there any probability the u.s brings some type of reserve back in whether it's like semi gold reserve or some type of asset correlated to fiat so so that's actually what i would say that is the bet with bitcoin I, I i suspect at some point a government is going to peg to bitcoin or start buying up in the free market or buying mm. something for the free market and then peg um and once that happens, all government, uh, other governments will be forced to yeah. move really fast it, it, because of the network effect. Yeah, it's interesting. Pay attention. We have a halving coming up in two, three weeks in Bitcoin where half the mining reward goes away. Yeah. And so that could be a downward pressure on Bitcoin in the short term. Yes. But, uh, but it just because if you know, understand the fundamentals of how it works. But then, uh, but then on the back half of that, uh, as as miners become profitable again because of people falling out of market, um, uh, there should be a, a massive acceleration. I always tell people the, this is Bitcoin is the millennial real estate. Yeah, it it, 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 it it's probably um, if you if you if you accept some of the things we're saying, and you know the governments have to kind of debase their currencies to try to get out of the debt hole, then it's a logical, it's a logical step again. It's a logical protection of wealth against them. Mm. Yeah. Well, Jeff, I just want to thank you so much for coming on and sharing your thoughts. I know you have your new book out. Where can people uh, get that? Uh, Amazon's probably best. Okay. Yeah.